All right, let's see it. Myra starts with c4. He's playing against Vio, Vioranu Boktan, who is a strong player, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not quite sure about his rating right now. I think a pretty good player. Yeah, and here, actually, I need to say something early on because I'm not happy with this opening. Uh, I don't think it gives White anything. Um, even more so, you're in the defense early on with this isolated pawn. So you take twice here and you get this isolated pawn. Black will take back on d5. And I don't think you're posing any problems for black here. So uh, maybe not even play e4. Play something else here. g3, knight of 3, d4, whatever. Whatever uh, rides your boat. Okay? This line I'm not a fan of for white at all. And here you play queen e2 check, uh, which doesn't help you, it just helps black, okay? Uh, in general, there are some golden rules in the opening, which is develop your minor pieces, castle, play for center, grab some space, okay? But <laughs> maybe if I can include another rule is don't move your queen too early. And here queen e2 is not doing you any favor. Black wants to play bishop b7 anyway, or bishop d6, develop his bishop, and you're spending mo one more move uh, on something which is not of priority right now. You want to castle first. You want to play knight f3 and castle. And then you can later on think about the queen, but first I would also play d4, move to bishop. The queen is usually one for later piece to be moved, okay? So just bishop a4 here, just move the bishop back. Okay, so I guess this was your idea, but still. Yes, you are giving black an isolated pawn too, but the problem is that you're really lacking behind the development here. And if black had played b5, b4 here, as you said yourself, he's, he already has a great advantage. Alright, he played knight d5. Now d4 was a good move. Takes, takes, d5, and yes, you have come out of this fairly well h3 is also a nice move Just stopping bishop g4 restricting the options of the bishop knight e4 castle knight takes c3 and now you play queen takes c3 but here b takes c3 really is interesting because you're not allowing black to go with the bishop to f5 and i don't think this pawn is is too much of an issue here uh, you can just defend with d2 bishop d2 say bishop e6 and you can i mean you don't even have to defend it right now you can also play the bishop somewhere else oh, but bishop d2 seems to make sense to me and uh, play rook e1 and so on and and the bishop is not as active as in the game so just something to consider b takes c3 an interesting alternative queen takes bishop f5 bishop f4 rook c8 queen d2 yeah, for some reason I like queen g3 here better. Um, now if bishop f6, you actually have bishop d6. So probably black should play bishop h4 first. And now queen e3, bishop f6, bishop d b3. Okay. Yeah, feels like more or less the same stories in the game. Yeah, probably doesn't change that much. Okay, queen d2, bishop f6. And now you miss this move rook c4, which is coming after rook c1. Which is, yeah, a typical way to play, I would say. Um, well, now you've seen it, obviously, now you know it. But, um, yeah, it especially makes sense as the bishops are placed here in f6 and f5 perfectly. So bishop b3 instead was the way to go to stop that. So... This is coming down to prophylactic thinking, really. Okay, what does my opponent want to play next? Okay, rook c4 is an obvious threat with the double attack. And then, do I stop rook, rook ac1? Or can he still play? And then you easily see, oh, rook c4 is still annoying. And then you'll be like, okay, I need to play bishop b3 after all. And um, stop rook c4 for good. Okay. So this is just always a useful technique. I know Tal Baron... 
uh, my fellow YouTuber, he was holding several streams with Hutch and he was, they were consulting together and all he was saying, he was always prompting these two questions. What is my opponent threatening? And uh, if he's not threatening anything that I have to take care of, then what is my worst piece that I can improve on? Okay. And especially, I, I'm not sure with the second question, I mean, this is also very useful to ask yourself this, but cannot always yield that great benefits. But asking you the first question can make such a difference. Just, I mean, optimally, before you play every move or after every move of your opponent, ask yourself, what would my opponent play next if I didn't play any move? Okay. What would, what would my opponent play next if I just played nothing? Of course, that's not allowed in chess, but it's a, it's a good method to, to figure out what your opponent is going to do. I mean, at least getting an idea. And here it's not so difficult to figure out. All right, so now you have to defend. You lose a pawn here, the pawn on d4. Yeah, bishop c4 takes, 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 takes 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 but this end game is not too bad i mean you're down a pawn but i think it should be defendable even though of course unpleasant and here you play bishop d do bishop d2 i think going active immediately rook d6 makes a lot of sense rook a8 now rook b6 to so stop any a5 and you're so active with the rook i think you have great drawing potential here bring the king next of course black has some some ideas still he could play something like bishop f6 the idea bishop d8 but let's say bishop c5 bishop d8 now rook c6 a5 okay and now bring the king and um, it won't be easy for black to make any progress here i mean if he plays a4 i mean what next right your rook is so active i don't think black can win this really if you defend carefully okay bishop d2 rook f rook c8 and now again rook d6 activity it's so important in the end game always try to be active even if that means you lose a pawn i mean you, you already lost a pawn earlier but uh especially with rooks rooks love to be active they really do and sometimes even worth one or two pawns, um, especially in rook end games, can make all the difference how active your rook is and how active your king is. So, okay, here maybe not rook b6 because now with the bishop on, not on e3 anymore, black can go bishop d4, which is annoying. But just bring the king again and I think can put up a great defense here really make it difficult for black very good drawing chance i believe okay bishop b4 bishop e5 yeah now rook d6 is not possible anymore king f1 f6 and now you're playing king e2 and that just loses on the spot okay so the one thing you don't want to happen here is that the rooks come off the board because then it's just an easy win that's exactly what king e2 allows um so you would need to go a3 here to prepare king e2 it will be tough, let's be honest. It will not be easy to defend this position. And um, Black has very good chances now because you're not, you don't have this active rook as we've seen in the variations before, but um, you're fighting, okay? After king e2, it's game over. If you play bishop d2, a pawn is just dropping. If, if rook d2 is just lost, this position is just lost. There's really nothing you can do here. Okay. And uh, yeah. Resignation. So yeah. It, it felt like you could have put up a, a much better defense here in the end game. And the key word is really activity. Be as active as you can. As it is reasonable. Okay. Don't drop all your pawns just so your rook is active. But be as active as you can. And that can really make the task so much more difficult for the opponent.
And then earlier, okay, I criticized your opening as you noticed probably. So you might want to look into this, that he plays something else there. And in general, of course, there are exceptions, but it's useful to follow these golden rules, develop minor pieces, cast. I mean, you know that stuff, obviously. But even for me, sometimes it's, it's important to go back to these basics and remember, okay, don't play any uh, artificial stuff, which feels unnatural, okay? And this queen e2, d6 was just a little bit slow, it felt like to me. All right, let's get to your other game that you submitted, which is 